Welcome to the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Ron Duncan Hart, and it's my pleasure today to welcome Professor Sarah Habervalle Stein from UCLA, who will be in conversation about her new book, Family Papers, A Sephardic Journey Through the 20th Century, with Dr. Vanessa Paloma Elbaz of the University of Cambridge and the Sorbonne. Both are specialists in Sephardic life and culture, and I think we're in for a most interesting discussion. Professor Stein holds the Viterbi Family Endowed Chair in Mediterranean Jewish Studies at UCLA, where she is also the director of the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies. Professor Stein is one of the leading voices and most prolific writers in Jewish studies today. In fact, she was honored with the Guggenheim Fellowship for exceptional capacity for productive scholarship. She has published nine books and her work has been recognized with two National Jewish Book Awards. She is also the winner of the prestigious Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature, one of the most important prizes in Jewish studies. And the current book, Family Papers, was named the best book of the year by The Economist and by Mosaic Magazine. It was an editor's choice for the New York Times and a National Jewish Book Award finalist. Professor Stein will be joined in conversation today by Dr. Vanessa Paloma Elbaz, who is a research associate at the University of Cambridge and a Marie Curie Fellow at the Sorbonne. Her work on the transmission of Judeo-Spanish identity through music and songbooks uh, through the Trans-Gibraltar region and the larger Mediterranean has received awards from Fulbright, the American Sephardi Federation, among others. Dr. Abbas is the founder of Hoya, the Jewish Morocco Sound Archive, and her forthcoming monograph on the centrality of women's voices in the Morocco Judeo-Spanish life is scheduled for publication by Brill in 2022. Her work has been featured by the New York Times, BBC, Jerusalem Post, PBS, and others. It is a pleasure to welcome both of you. And Dr. Stein, if you could begin with a comment about family papers. Well, thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's my delight to be speaking with you today. And Vanessa, it's my greatest appreciation to be in conversation with you. Um, and um, we're speaking today about uh, my book, Family Papers, A Sephardic Journey Through the 20th Century. And um, mostly we are going to have the pleasure of being in conversation, but Vanessa and I thought that it might be nice to begin with a, a very short reading of the opening of the book, which to a certain extent sets the stage for the story that follows, especially because this um, storyline is unfamiliar to, I think, many even devoted followers of um, Jewish history. So I'm going to begin by reading really just for a few moments from the opening of Family Papers, a section that I have called Writers. This is the story of a single Sephardic family whose roots connect them to a place and community that no longer exist. The place was the port city of Ottoman Salonika, present day Thessaloniki, Greece, one of the few cities in modern Europe ever to claim a Jewish majority. The community was made up of mostly Ladino or Judeo-Spanish speaking Jews, Sephardic families who trace their ancestry back to Sepharad, medieval Iberia, from which they were expelled in the 1490s, but who for the next five centuries called the Ottoman Empire Southeastern Europe and Salonika home. Today, the papers of the Levy family are spread across nine countries and three continents. The single largest collection, the papers of Leon Levy, is kept by his four grandchildren in a private vault in Rio de Janeiro. It consists of nearly 5,000 handwritten and typed letters, telegrams, photographs, legal and medical documents, and miscellany address books, expired passports, and more, by far the largest private archive, archive I have ever encountered as a professional historian and near obsessive document hunter. In a suitcase in a spare garage in a retirement village outside Johannesburg, there is another repository of Levy family papers, 
smaller than the Rio collection, the South African one is nonetheless of immeasurable historical import. It, it includes such cherished souvenirs as a silhouette cut in Salonica in 1919, capturing the likeness of a young woman about to emigrate from her native city, never to return. Other family papers have turned up in private hands in England. One collection boxed up in a home in London has survived multiple migrations from Greece to Great Britain, to Germany, to India, back to Great Britain and on to the United States. Another housed in a scenic village outside Manchester contains fragile glass slides taken in 1917 in Salonika's Jewish cemetery, then the largest Jewish cemetery in Europe. Yet more documents, photographs, and objects have materialized in Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Great Britain, Greece, Hungary, Israel, Italy, Portugal, and the United States. Not only family-owned papers, but documents and photographs held by 30 archives. Travel documents, naturalization papers, birth, death, and medical records, letters exchanged by relatives, lovers, and friends, business papers, even a baptismal certificate. All told, these scattered sources have allowed me to trace an intimate arc of the 20th century. The Levy family papers catalog the lives and losses of multiple generations, contain papers written in eight languages, and reflect correspondence among members of a single family spanning the globe. This is a Jewish story, an Ottoman story, a European story, a Mediterranean story, and a diasporic story, a story of how women, men, and children experienced wars, genocide, and migration, the collapse of old regimes, and the rise of new nations. The Levy papers also reveal how this family loved and quarreled, struggled and succeeded, clung to one another, and watched the ties that once bound them slip from their grasp. Thank you for that. So um, I will actually start, I, I, I had thought to start with something else, but in hearing this rereading, something comes up for me that I'd love to hear you um, expound upon. And it's uh, the, the fact that it's the story of a Sephardi family, right? A family from that had been expulsed from Sephardad, but but that deep longing for Sephardad doesn't seem to appear really anywhere throughout the book. It's we have some Ladino poems, and you know, there the Ladino shows up, and but really, when they emigrate, they emigrate to other places. They're the Sephardad, that mythology of the Sephardi umbilical cord connecting them to Sephardad does not seem to be coming through in the book. And yeah. so, I'd love for you to talk about why. That's a really that's a wonderful question. Um, this family is um, undoubtedly and intimately, uh, indelibly Sephardic. Um, and it comes through in a variety of respects, the food they eat, um, the language they speak, um, the blessings they offer, um, the names they give their children. Um, um, the way they understand their cultural positioning. But you're right. In terms of a longing for Sepharad, I don't think that I felt it in their writing, in the way they wrote to one another, in the way they imagined their lives. Um, they are so uh, crucially of um, Iberian descent, of a Judeo-Spanish cultural world. That is unquestionable. But in terms of longing for an, the erstwhile homeland of Spain, um, it is not something, or, or Iberia, let us say, the Iberian Peninsula, it is really not something that they grappled with. Um, indeed, as the family history progressed through the period that I am following it, 19th century into the 20th century and forward to, the, to as late as the 1970s, 
um, that real and mythical homeland, Sepharad, really becomes replaced because now the migrations are from another homeland. They are from the homeland that the family has occupied for five centuries, the city of Salonika, present day Thessaloniki, Southeastern Europe, the Ottoman Empire, or later Greece, that has become their origin point, what one member of the family refers to as the cradle of their childhood. So a kind of nostalgia or wistfulness or emotive relationship to Iberia, um, I really do not find which is not to say they are not of Sepharad, which is not to say they are not Sephardic. Um, but I feel it is so profoundly overshadowed by the depth of their connection to the Ottoman world in which they were enmeshed, enmeshed for so many generations. Um, and then even after the empire ceases to exist to that once multicultural world of Southeastern Europe, which becomes less multicultural, of course, as the generations uh, progress. Um, but it's, it's an incredibly interesting observation. Um, my colleague, Devin Nahr, who's written a wonderful book on called and on Jewish Salonika, has written about how, while the notion of Sephardic being Sephardic, of course, existed among the Judeo-Spanish Jews, the idea of a yearning for Spain, a yearning for Sepharad is actually quite a modern invention alongside so many of the other political fashionings that were taking shape for Jews the world over in the late 19th century and into the 20th. So um, I think that we should not assume that that longing was a constant um, or a condition but instead that it um, might have appealed to some more than others and at some times more than others um, through the long durée of Sephardic history. Yeah, I mean, I think that it might even be, you know, Hobsbawm's in invented tradition. It's like, it, they, they actually are very grounded in where they are and that's, and, and Sephardad is, it's not Libi Bemisrach, you know, it's not, it's, it's really, they're there. And so um, I think it, it really struck me when you read that opening again to see that actually really they feel, this whole story feels completely Ottoman and an Ottoman diaspora and that they're Sephardic, but this, the, the contemporary political talkings about that don't don't really gel with what the story what the papers tell us i think that's right and even once the family begins to launch into emigre paths um spain and portugal are not the places that they are magnetically drawn to because these are not the emigre destinations for this judeo-spanish diaspora france um, and especially Paris absor will absorb the most, but Manchester is also crucial. And yet this family also has those who go to places that are a bit off the grid of the Sephardic global diasporic map, um, including um, India, as I mentioned, and Brazil. Not entirely, um, not entirely out of the realm of possibility, as the family indicates, but not the obvious choice. And Spain and Portugal were not. There is a history that I talk about in this book and I've written about elsewhere, um, whereby some Salonican Jews tried to acquire the passports of modern Spain and modern Portugal, especially at a crucial moment, moment um, in the history of this region when the Ottoman Empire's boundaries were retracting. And it wasn't yet clear which states would control the land in which Jews lived, um, especially in the city of Salonika. It wasn't clear what the fate of the city would be, especially in the course of the uh, Balkan Wars, 1911 to 1912. And at that moment, there is a very practical yearning 
for the passport of Spain or the passport of Portugal, but also the passport of Austro-Hungary and of other polities that is handing it out at the, at the same time. So I think it's a, it's a profound point that they, um, to the extent that Iberia, Sepharad, marks them, it has become such a, a nuanced piece of their culture as expressed through language and, um, and, um, and food, and as I said, names and other things, uh, music, um, but not something that is for them um, uh, articulated as a kind of um, um, engine of emotion uh, or even engine of their own pathways. Yes, okay, so now I want to ask you something that has to do with my own interest in the voice and um, thinking about the, the prequel as I feel to, to this book, uh, which is the, the, the book of Saadi Halevi, right? The journalist from the 19th century, I guess, but he was also a very important singer. And um, I love that scene in the book where he's like running down the street because they're running after him. The rabbis are running after him because he has been singing Turkish melodies onto Hebrew, um, onto Hebrew words. So this, this very Ottoman-ness of the music, but bringing it into Jewish liturgy and, and the scandal of yes. that. But so, so I'm interested in this idea of, of how this family has used the voice in different ways one which is the ritual baitan traditional way of using the voice and then the journalistic voice which had such a very important and profound impact in um in the safari in the judeo spanish speaking community and even french um with their their newspapers and then now with the letters we have this this personal voice through time. So what do you think that it has to do with the same line of, of expression? How, how do you feel that that transformation and does it, does it weave back and forth or is it more linear mm. in its how temporality? Right. Um, a wonderful and challenging question. Um, you know, I can begin by explaining to those who are with us who, who haven't read the book that the book is tracing the arc of a family history over many generations. And um, the story begins with a patriarch named Saadi Betzalel Ashkenazi Alevi, who was known by contemporaries by his first name, Saadi. And I came to this project, Family Papers, after first finishing a project with my dear friend and um, colleague and former teacher, Aaron Rodrigue, um, through which we sought to bring to translation in English and transliteration in Ladino, um, a memoir that Saadi wrote over the last decades of his life. And he was, Vanessa, as you describe, he was a, um, a printer, a publisher, a journalist, a newspaper editor, and also, by avocation, um, a musician, a singer, and a composer. Um, and the scene that you describe is a scene of trauma for him, um, which is that he was a key, he um, used his printing press as a mouthpiece to voice um, his modern ideas, which include a, included a critique of the rabbinical establishment of his city, Salonika. He accused the rabbinic elite <clears throat> of various um, ill deeds, including abuse of public finances. And in response, um, the rabbinical establishment uses a, a rare tool that it still has, which is the tool of excommunication. Uh, and he is literally run through the city with the rabbinical henchmen at his heels. And he is so traumatized by this experience of excommunication that he writes a memoir to vindicate his name. Um, the scribe, he has a scribe 
put into print um, a memoir that presumably he dictates that describes his life, his world, uh, and um, attempts to salvage his reputation. And it was this manuscript that led me circuitously to the Levy family. Now, to get back to your question about, about voice, he was a singer, he was a writer of song, he was a writer of words, he was a publisher of words. And much of the family followed in his, um, in his footsteps, although I suppose you should say in his sound waves. Um, they were also writers, they were teachers, they were, um, they included um, a public official um, whose um, voice stood for the voice of the entire community of interwar Jewish Salonika. Um, so for many in the family, I think that there was, let's use your language, a fidelity to voice, to letters, to papers, but not only to papers written, also to um, to utterance. Uh, and um, although music did not pass steadily through his family, this commitment to words certainly did. Now, it's not to say that all were luminaries. There were members of the family whose histories I trace in this book, who were women and men of business, who were um, women of, of the needle trade, um, men who failed at business uh, and had to leave their home in, in um, amidst a climate of shame. So I don't want to make it appear as if this is a, um, only a story of success stories and of success stories having to do with the written word, but letters became a passion for the family. And I think that that passion partly was out of a sense of fealty to the storied past of a single family whose relationship to printing and words and music stretched back, um, not only to Saadi himself, but to his father and his grandfather and even his great-grandfather, as well as his mother and his grandmother and his great-grandmother. Um, so uh, it, I think that this relationship to, um, to communicating, even if communicating in a, in a very labyrinthine sense came in the form of producing the kind of clothing as women in the family did and men that would announce a modern body. That commitment was an inheritance. And one reason I call the book Family Papers is I make the point in the book that papers were an inheritance. And I think by extension, voice was an inheritance. And it came to be that as migration pulled the family apart and as time pulled them apart and as they came to speak many languages and live in many countries and upon many continents, um, there was something that held them together. And that something, it wasn't belief, it wasn't Judaism, it wasn't blood necessarily, it was actually papers. Uh, and it is out of a kind of homage, the importance of that connection that the book bears, bears the name Family Papers. Yeah, so that actually um, segues exactly to the next big thing that I wanted to look at, which is paper, right? This idea of, of the papers, the papers that are carrying these voices, right? Or these thoughts or this legacy. And um, I love how you said this, um, this issue of the needle and the embodiment and the showing the modern body. And so this, the paper also kind of embodies this, this aspect of living, you know, having the rupture of the war and the, the terrible grief of the completely destroyed community. And, but somehow rebuilding from the ashes and, and all that. And so I wonder if we could say that these papers then become like the lieu de mémoire. They're like Pierre Nora's, like that's the place, that is where the memory is. It's like a, a, a block of memory that is passed on the paper in itself. It carries so heavily the weight of the memory of 
all these generations back, five, six, seven generations, even though not everything is voiced. It's, yeah, I think that there are, um, I think the papers do contain that feeling of connection within them. And then additionally, there are um, material objects that over time seem to compel the family. Uh, I'll just offer a couple of examples that pertain to the his to the um, the lingering and impactful history of the family patriarch Saadi. Um, one is his tombstone. Um, he, because he was a man of distinction, was buried in the Jewish cemetery of Salonika and given a a, both a large and unusually shaped um, and unusually wordy headstone. And um, the family would return to his grave chosen carefully and would refer to the words of that tombstone in print a generation after generation until that stone was um, desecrated when the Jewish cemetery of Salonika was desecrated uh, by the Greek municipality in the course of the Second World War when the city was under occupation by the Nazis. Um, it became a kind of um, touchstone, paying homage, visiting it before you left um, the city to, to emigrate abroad. Um, taking photographs there in a in a new bar mitzvah suit, um, and there were other touchstones as well. There was um, there are certain photographs that still today I find single photographs hanging in the homes of disparate branches of the family who do not know one another, but just one. And there were others to be found, but just one. Um, the White Tower in Salonika, an iconic site in the city was also a place to which pilgrimages were made, even for people who didn't grow up in the city, who lived abroad, but photographs in front of this site, writing about visiting this site. So there are um, iconic touchstones for the family that are evocative and symbolic and that that symbolism actually persists through the generations in, in an amazingly steady fashion. And this is the thing that is so, I mean, I think that many families have this, but that you've been able to really pull through in this story, in all the different um, pieces of all these different characters is how sometimes not even, how some, somehow a transmission happens without it necessarily being forced. And I wonder, what you think about how it is that they're actually able to do this. What, what is it? What is the mechanism that they use to be able to transmit beyond even knowing each other? Um, it's a fascinating question. And I would say that um, DNA is such a complicated thing, but family memory is also such a, a complicated thing. Shared traits are complex. Um, and I think we also have to remember that every family has its black sheep um, so that not everybody is somebody that the family wishes to remember or celebrate. And so our, our evocations tend to be the positive evocations. And I, and I do write in the book about a memory we can certainly discuss that the family systematically erased, did not want to have as a part of their inheritance. Um, and I refer to a story um, involving a great betrayal of the family during the Second World War and of, of the community as a whole. Um, but I did spend time wondering what is it that makes a family? What are the things that hold them, a family together? And when does a family fall apart? That is also a question that I ask. When does a family become so diffuse, geographically, genealogically, in terms of its religious practice, linguistic practice, that it is no longer uh, a single entity? That's also a question that 
um, preyed on my mind during the writing of, of family papers. I want to mention, I think we missed, because we missed our introduction, we missed certain technological um, rule laying out, but I did see that a participant had a hand up and I think perhaps it's appropriate to invite anybody who is joining us live to put a question in the chat and Vanessa and I will both do our very best to attend to those as they um, arise. So I'm interested also in this, um, the, the experience of the men and the women that appear through this, this century long story and, um, and how it's quite different um, from each other. The men have a, a more traditional economic role. The women mostly have a more familial role and, uh, and the voice of, I think it's Vida, mm -hmm. the, the wife of Daoud who writes that one letter in desperation to her son for money. Um, and that hope that it seems that it's because she didn't know how to write. So she actually dictated it. And so this, this transitional generation actually that um, where, where the women still didn't have the, the learning uh, but their voice was still very strong within the family. And, and so I'm just interested if you could talk a little bit about the gender roles and the, how, how you saw that playing through all these different yeah. voices yeah, I was through very this time. Committed. Yeah, I was very committed to telling the story of the women in this family. Um, and um, there are many women protagonists that hear that help drive this story forward. And I thought that it was crucial that it not be a male dominated story. But in fact, um, in fact, the, um, the women were breadwinners from a very early time. So for example, Saadi, um, with whom I begin, his mother in the early 19th century um, turned to the needle trade um, and was known as quite a famous um, uh, seamstress who provided the city's up and coming middle class and, and foreign population with Western style shirts. She was famous for this. And she had learned to sew from her own mother. So dating back to the 18th century in this family, we have women who were the breadwinners, who were skilled, um, who, who were tradeswomen, uh, and who held their family together in the face of, um, in the face of um, the early death of husbands, for example, uh, or other family crises, early death of, of sons who might become breadwinners in their place. And that story goes forward too just as papers weave together this family, um, so too does, does the needle trade, does thread weave through the family history, connecting women as well as men. So um, women have in this family actually a remarkably loud role as, um, not, as breadwinners um, um, and as writers. Uh, and there is one remarkable woman who is a daughter. Saadi had 11 children with two wives, one after the other. Um, there is one daughter of this family who um, became a teacher in a, a, for the schools of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which was a, a French Jewish philanthropy that opened schools across the Mediterranean and Middle East designed to offer instruction for girls and boys um, of Mediterranean and Middle Eastern Jewish background, although non-Jews enrolled as well, in um, secular subjects, in, including the French language, um, which was meant to give them a platform for their um, economic and moral and social advancement. That was the vision of the Alliance. 
one of Sadi's daughters then becomes a teacher who is um, assigned placement um, in schools all across the Middle East, you know, from Morocco um, to Jerusalem to um, Damascus uh, to Istanbul. Uh, remarkable. This is in the first years of the 20th century. Um, so to reconstruct the history of this family is also to reconstruct incredible stories of women um, who uh, produced pr produced um, cultural products like clothing, but letters and, and histories, and needless to say, emotions all their own. And I was quite determined to let their stories loom large. You mentioned Vida as one who, who is represented here. Um, Vida was married to one of Saadi's sons, um, a very distinguished figure um, named, whose given name was David Alevi, but who came, became known as Daoud Afendi. Um, first, he occupied a position in the Ottoman passport um, office in Salonika, and with time, he came to be the single most important public figure representing the Jewish community of Salonika through the interwar years. Um, his wife, Vida, then, uh, was from a, um, a, a, a family of import, yet my suspicion is that she was illiterate, which I can only guess at given that, um, given that among the thousands of papers I have found and letters, um, including to her emigre children, none appear in her own hand, although she is always sending blessings and objects to her children and, uh, and more. And there is one document which she dictates to her daughter uh, who then transcribes it um, for the daughter's brother abroad. Um, and try, uh, it was very important to me to reconstruct not only the history of the most literary luminary members of the family, but also to reconstruct the history and the um, world of a woman like this, who didn't have the means to leave an archival trail, um, such as others in the family were able. I think that Maybe we'll arrive to the last question. I mean, I have a whole series of other things, but we also want to open the floor. Um, and maybe I'll finish with a question to you on how you made your choices of how you decided to tell this story. How did you decide to structure it in this way with the different, with the, first we start with Ottomans and then nationals, emigres, captives, and then you have the stories of each of the people that, Actually, it was interesting because while I was reading it, that there was a name that would come back. And then I was like a little bit at first it confused, like, well, why is this person here? Wasn't they, weren't they before? And then I realized, oh, because they're, they were an Ottoman. And then there's also, they're also a national and they're also an emigre, right? So some of the people go through various um, of these steps. So how, how did you choose that and not another way of actually telling the story of this trove of of yeah. papers, of letters. Um, of well, material. I did make a, this narrative choice to organize each chapter around a person. Um, some of whom, as you say, appear more than once through the book and some of whom for unique reasons appear only once in the book. Um, I, it is a work of history. It is a work of nonfiction. So I am very careful never to put words in their mouth um, but I have used an extensive um, documentary and evidentiary trail to um, retrace their movements and to try to understand um, their experiences, uh, including the most intimate experiences of loss and love and hope and disappointment and more. Um, so the book... Uh, what I chose to do was um, follow people in such a way as um, that each individual would help us move the story forward chronologically from the Ottoman period to the post-Ottoman world of Greek Salonika, which comes to be known as Thessaloniki, um, through the tumultuous era of the First World War, um, the population transfers that bring Christians from um, Turkey uh, 
to Greece in exchange for Muslims from Greece who are sent to, to Turkey, thereby totally changing the ethnic um, makeup of the city through a dramatic fire of 1917 that, that absolutely um, transfigures the face of the city and the face of its Jewish community um, through stories of emigration and of course also through the story of the Holocaust which devastates this family um, not only in Salonika but within its main emigre hub of Paris. Um, so I chose in each instance someone who could embody a moment, um, not in the way that a law can embody a moment or um, the movement of a political boundary can embody a moment, but really the way a human being can embody a moment on a, on a very intimate and human scale. Uh, and there were people and characters who ended up on the cutting room floor in this process, but my goal was to allow us to see global history um, and diaspora, yes, a diaspora history and a family history on a human scale. And that really dictated the choice um, to select this narrative device and also dictated the way in which um, I chose the people and the tone uh, with which to represent them. Great. Well, um, I'm, I'm, uh... I, I have my notebook here with so many other things that I'd love to, to discuss, but uh, I know that we have some, some questions. So I'll, um, I'll take a look and then maybe I can read them out to you. Oh, there was somebody that asked, have any of the descendants read your book and what was their reaction? And has there been any link in any way of the disparate parts of the family? Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, as I was writing the book, I was really struck by the fact that the disparate branches of the family did not lean on me to connect them. So I knew distant cousins all around the world and I expected that they would ask to be introduced. And the family was hesitant for, for a variety of reasons, I'm certain. Um, and I concluded the book with a bit of, um, a bit of, let's say, bittersweet reflection on why this was so. On the one hand, it reflected that the family was deeply rooted in new homes and identities. And on the bitter side, reflected that this meant that to some extent they were less family than previous generations had been. But I'm delighted to say I was somewhat proven wrong in the course of pandemic, because after the publication of family papers, um, the family used the book to navigate an extended family reunion across um, many countries and generations. And I joined a Zoom reunion of the extended family in November of last year, um, which spanned, I think, four, five countries, uh, four continents. And these were people who had not met before the publication of family papers. So in a curious twist, this family that was once, um, was once so bound by letters and by paper, uh, again became bound by paper um, due to um, the publication of a book. So I see there is a oh, well, question in the chat about, I believe, thank you. I believe this question was meant to be about the Ottoman Empire asking to, to speak a little bit more about its, um, its history. So um, I'm referring here to um, Jews' place in an empire um, that they lived in for five centuries, that at its largest stretched um, not only through Europe um, and the Middle East um, into North Africa, um, was one of the most expansive and powerful empires um, in the modern world. And at its geographic expanse, at, at its geographic height, its expanse stretched um, across regions we think of in the modern history as enormously um, divergent one from the other. So 
this society, Ottoman society, was um, an internally multi-ethnic one in which um, individual religious communities, uh, those recognized by the Islamic um, Sultanate to, to be um, people of the book, um, had a lot of autonomy to oversee their own legal, cultural, economic affairs. And Jews under, who lived under Ottoman rule, um, like Jews who lived under Islam in other places of the modern world, had a great deal of independence and autonomy and opportunities for um, social betterment and um, faced for the most part um, an, um, a relative lack of anti-Semitism relative to what Jews under Christian rule experienced. Now things will change uh, in the 20th century, but for the duration of the Ottoman period, Jews who lived there felt a great kinship to empire um, and a great loyalty to empire. And when the empire began to um, be dismantled and to dissolve, for that, which happened for a variety of reasons, many Jews very rightly worried that the rise of the new nation state, a nation state like Greece, would be more threatening to their autonomy and cultural independence than the empire had been. And that proved to be quite right, that their, um, the process of investing themselves in new states, which they were actively involved in, came with a certain loss of autonomy. It came with certain advantages, but it also came with a certain loss of communal autonomy. So it's a fascinating history um, of Ottoman Jewry. I know that the question answerer wrote Byzantine, but I, I'm certain that they were referring to this context of the Ottoman world. There is another question asking you if there's any information about a family member that you were asked by a different family member not to include in the book. Mm. Um, not exactly, but um, not so far from the truth either. The family was incredibly understanding that I would write a history that I felt was true to the historical record, um, true to the sources I was able to unearth. Um, and they were very conscientious not to seek to um, guide my hand. But it did happen that I uncovered a very traumatic history um, as I was researching this family story, which I alluded to, to earlier, Vanessa, in answer to one of your questions. And this concerned a family member who, during the Second World War, uh, during the Nazi occupation of the city of Salonika and of Greece, um, there was a family member who um, served the Nazis as the head of the Jewish police of Salonika. And in that capacity, and because he was a, um, an extreme sadist, um, uh, was responsible for um, many, many horrific crimes um, that spanned from um, sexual violence to the ferreting out of Jews who were in hiding um, and much, much more spoliation of, of wealth and property of members of his own community. And after the war, he was captured and tried um, by the Greek state and accused of, um, for the accusation of complicity with the Nazis and was found guilty. Uh, and would indeed prove to be the only Jew, as far as I understand, in all of Europe who would be executed by a state um, for such a crime. And this was a horrific discovery. And I might, it wasn't that a family member told me not to write about it. I felt horrible writing about such a horrific discovery after having spent years coming to know this family dead and alive intimately. But, uh, and the family, not living members of the family, but deceased members of the family had made an effort to erase this dreadful chapter from their family history. So he was excised from family trees. He was never mentioned by name in letters, for example. But I am a professional historian 
And I knew that it was my job to tell the story that I had unearthed, delicate as, as it was. And the family was extremely um, understanding of the importance of telling their long history uh, in all of its nuances and not just for its um, most flattering ones. So I'm, I'm very grateful to them for their appreciation really of the, uh, of the power of historical um, writing and of historical honesty. Yeah, that must have been a very they, difficult yeah. conversation. Yeah. Uh, There's another question. How did you get coming in on the chat? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Gloria asks about the yeah. question of of um, how I found these people and how did they how did they come to open their papers for me? Um, well, the first thing to say is it takes a lot of sleuthing um, to hunt down a family history over so many generations, and I'm sure that among our uh, live listeners and listeners later, there will be genealogical sleuths who know exactly what I mean about the kind of dedication that is required to um, unspool a family history over uh, extended generations. So there was that determination on my part and sleuthing and um, a great deal of digging. But when it came to the actual encounters with people, I was um, delighted at the generosity of this family, um, who pretty much without a without hesitation, well, maybe with a bit of hesitation, but but in the end, with great kindness, opened their homes, opened their papers to me, gave me permission to cite them and use photographs from their collection. The greater frustration was not gaining access um, or trust, which of course one builds. Um, as a scholar, uh, as a historian, one builds over time with the people. And th these are people who, some of whom I, I corresponded with for a decade and still correspond with today. Um, but there is still the question of dead ends. And there were some dead ends that confounded me. Um, the attempt to find branches of the family whose trail ran cold. Uh, and it is inevitable that after a book like this is published, some of those trails that had seemed to run cold end up, you know, you end up finding a pathway and there's that frustration that you couldn't tell the whole story. But um, one has to reconcile oneself as a historian that you are never telling the whole story. You're only telling the story that you are able um, to wrap your hands and mind around uh, at a given time. Welcome back. So I wonder if we have okay. any Oh, Do great. Yes. One of the figures in the book that interested me was Daoud Effendi, uh, or David Halevi. Um, he's an interesting transitional figure because of he, he lived through the change from Turkish rule to Christian rule in Salonika. And he represents in many ways that transition between Muslim rule and Christian rule. Could you comment on that? He is the man I referred to earlier who um, had a, a role of distinction uh, serving the Ottoman Empire. And after his city became Greek, uh, came to be um, the chancellor of the Jewish community of, um, of Salonika through the interwar period, um, a position also of great distinction. Um, um, and I know the question was partly about how Jews weathered a transition from Muslim rule to Christian rule. And that is part of the story, but it is also a story about how um, Jews experience a change from an empire that was multi-ethnic and exhibited for, a, um, exhibited, um, tolerance to a degree of its subjects, not all of its subjects. We understand that there was great intolerance exhibited to the Armenian population, for example, um, especially as the 20th century unfolded, um, uh, but that did have a kind of system in which tolerance was a bedrock of its management of religious communities. A transition from that model to a national model where 
the state, the Greek state set out actively as did other states in the region um, to nationalize its population, to diminish religious diversity, um, not only through um, not only through things like the, the population exchanges that sent the Muslim population to Turkey and accepted the Christian population from Turkey to Greece, but that sought to remap its own cities so that the Jewish and Muslim face of Salonika was erased building by building, street name by street name, especially after the fire of 1917 destroyed the historic Jewish port of Salonika uh, the historic port of Salonika, excuse me, which was also a Jewish center because Jews were so prominent in the uh, mercantile activities emanating from, from shipping. Um, so this, this transition was a frightening one um, because it not only came with the loss of communal autonomy that the Ottomans had respected, it also came with the assertion of Hellenic culture. And that included very practical things. What day were you required to close your business? Would it be forcibly, what day of the week would it be forcibly closed? Under the Ottomans, Salonika, the day of rest in Salonika was Jewish Sabbath because Jews had such a prominent role in the commerce. Under Greek rule, it would come to be Sunday, the Christian day of rest. So. Jews had reason to be wary of this transition and they had reason to be wistful for the Ottoman era. And yet what Daoud Fendi's history teaches us is that many of them nonetheless invested themselves in Greek society. Um, he really gave his soul to, um, to the state by service to the um, the significant Jewish community by being its leader. Um, so while some carried trepidation into the era of the Greek state, into the post-Ottoman era, at the same time, um, people were, Jews were remaking themselves, in this case, into Greek citizens. And this is also um, a story that my colleague Devin Nahr tells in his book, Jewish Salonika. So it is... Um, it is, and it is only at this time that Jews begin to learn Greek, which they really had no reason to use as a primary language under Ottoman rule. Because remember, the city was for a long time majority Jewish. So if you were going to choose any language, whether you were Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, Judeo-Spanish wouldn't be a bad choice. Um, so the transition is um, a nuanced one. And I, I loved using the figure of Daoud Effendi because through his position of prominence, he had to manage a community in dramatic transition um, through poverty, through um, population transfers, through war uh, before the Second World War. Of course, the First World War is enormously impactful for this community because this city is a, um, a staging ground for allied troops. And there is a tremendous movement of um, soldiers and refugees and um, foreigners through the city of Salonika as well as um, fighting itself. So he is a remarkable figure whose own story traverses such a dramatic um, sea change of history. Another thing that interested me in the book was the choices that people made in terms of m uh, migratory patterns after leaving Salonika. Um, I, I can understand the people um, having, coming from a background of speaking Judeo-Spanish, many of them chose to go to Latin America. But yet other families uh, chose Manchester, South Africa, uh, places where the, the language and the cultural background uh, maybe was uh, more different. Could you comment on that and how that affected the families? Yeah, the family emigrates in so many directions and that choice is so fateful. Where they go is so fateful um, for their future and their children's future and their grandchildren's future. Um, the one place that they went where they didn't stay for multiple generations was India. They were only there for two generations, but 
Brazil, England, France, um, South Africa, the family who, the United States, Canada, the family, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned Israel, the family that goes to all of these places does stay for multiple generations. And of course their paths are become profoundly divergent as they invest in new homes, as they speak new languages, um, in some cases, as they adopt new religions, um, as they enmesh themselves in new economies. Um, I remember being struck by a sentence um, in a letter from Leon Levy, the one who, the, the son of Daouta Fendi who goes to Rio, who writes his father that he is worried that his own son who is growing up in Rio is too Latin American. And I thought for a long time, you know, what did that mean to him? What did that mean, that fear? Because it's very complicated. Um, and I'm not sure that I can understand all the contours, but I tried to tease apart um, partly that anguish of knowing that your own child will grow up in a milieu so different than your own and so far from the family that you grew up with, with different cultural mores, speaking a different language, different gender norms, um, different racial dynamics, uh, different interracial dynamics. So, um, it is, um, it really is fascinating how the story of migration creates you know, permanent change, this we would expect. I wanna mention one other thing, Ron, in, in response to your question is this, what none could know, I think all in the family would expect and all of us would expect that that choice of where you move changes you and changes your descendants. We can accept this as a sort of human essential, but what none could have known is that that choice um, before the second world war is ultimately determinative of whether your descendants live and die because of the Holocaust. So if you make the choice to go to Manchester or to Rio, um, you will be, in, in Manchester, you'll be swept up in war, but you will not be under occupation. If you go to Paris, or you, you will be under occupation. And those who went to Paris um, suffered a variety of fates, but um, some fled to the South, which was the Vichy regime, um, um, and, and sometimes survived in hiding. Um, but others were deported to labor and death camps um, from Paris, their adopted emigre home. So emigration, of course, we understand, wouldn't spare you um, that fate if your choice was Paris. And who would have known that that roll of the dice would matter so much? Um, it was also true, you know, others went to Spain um, and managed to, to make their way to Portugal during the war. Um, so that is extraordinary to me that emigration, even within Europe, um, doesn't always bring the promise of protection that one imagined it, it might. Professor Stein and Dr. Obias, thank you so much for leading us through this conversation about family papers and the Halevi family Sephardic journey through the 20th century. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity and Vanessa for the conversation. Good to be with you both. Stay well. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. See you. Take care. Yeah.